Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. I'm not preaching today. I knew somebody was going to do that, so I thought I'd let you get it out of your system. But we do have a special guest speaker, and what amazes me is a lot of you don't know who he is. Um, How many years ago, how many years ago did you start here? In the 80s, before some of you were born. When we began this church, we built our first little building, and and people really didn't know what it was. And a gentleman pulled up to the corner out here, saw us, pulled in the driveway one Wednesday night, and he gave to us a sign. He said, you know, people don't know what this is. I said, probably don't. He said, you people need a sign. I said, yeah, we probably do. He said, "Uh, well, I have one on the back of my truck, and I'm waiting for him to tell me how much. And I'm just standing there, and he said, you people sure are hard to give something to. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've got a new sign in the back of my truck with all the letters. I'm going to give it to you. I said, why in the world would you want to give us a sign? He said, I have no idea. I pulled up at the corner out here, and the big fellow upstairs said, pull in here and give these people a sign. And he did. I've never seen him since. We put the sign in the front yard, put our church name on it in time of services, And there was a family that drove past here on a regular basis because they had relatives in defiance, and they saw the sign, and they decided that they would come here to church. The man of the household wasn't all that enthused. When he was here, he would sit about there (laughs) and stare out the window while I preached, kind of like some of you. (laughs) And I will never forget... He was on the pew out in the hallway. Uh, He stopped me. And he said, you know what? Everything I did in my life, I made a mess. And he said, I want to give it all to the Lord. And he did. He gave everything to the Lord, and he got involved in the church. This is what happens when you get saved. Started working in the church. Became kind of my right-hand man. He helped me with a lot of things. And I could see God working on his heart. And I knew that God was calling him. And it went for a long, long time. Finally, Christmas Eve, am I right? I got a phone call. It said, I got to tell you what happened tonight. I didn't know whether to call you tonight or not. I said, I've been waiting for a year. Why would you not call me tonight? And he said, God's called me into the ministry. And I hired him. He became my first associate here at the church. We got very close, good friends, spent a lot of time together. Well, then he kept promising me, I will never, ever leave this church. I love this church. This is my home. I will always be here. You can count on me, liar. Uh, (laughs) Took a call out to Sugar Creek, packed up and moved. And uh, I was a little bit lost, I have to admit. A lot of years have passed since then. Got out of the ministry for a while. And uh, here a few months ago, we had a heart-to-heart talk at my house. And uh, he said, I want to get back into ministry. He said, I believe the calling and election of God is without repentance. That's what the Scripture says. That means if God calls you, he calls you. God knows everything, right? Past, present, future. So God has all of the knowledge in the world when he calls you. Jesus called to Peter, and he said, I want you to follow me, knowing that someday Peter was going to deny Christ three times. But Jesus called him anyway. Thank God he called Peter. And I said, God, I will help you. I will do what I did before. I will license you, and we'll send you out. 
which tells me he wants to do a ministry for people who don't feel welcome in the church. There are people out there that feel that way for whatever reason, don't feel worthy, don't feel accepted, and they're hurting. They need God's help. And I said, I will support you in that. And so today, at the end of the service, I've got a license here in the pulpit. We're going to lay hands on him and license him from our church, send him out as a liaison from our church to do that kind of ministry. How many of you know Scott Snyder? How many of you knew? Oh, good, good. How many of you were here when he was here? Good, good. Even fewer, though, but it's amazing how the church changes over years. Um, we had our staff meeting the other night, and uh, I think Mike, Pastor Mike brought it up. He said, why don't you have him preach? That way people can get to know him before you license him. And I thought that's a good idea. Glad I thought of it. Uh, <laughs> that's why you have a staff, see? Uh, and so I called and I asked God if he would preach, and it's been a lot of years since he preached here. Um, but I want you, this is home, okay? Even over the years and how much changes have been taking place, I want you to make him feel at home and welcome him to the pulpit today. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 17 if you have them. You know, one of the things just to share, it was the, the small sanctuary over here is where I got saved. And it, it was, Jim was kind. I, when I was sitting in there listening to him preach, I, I didn't want to be there. I, I had other th places I wanted to be. I had uh, softball tournaments I wanted to be playing in on Sunday mornings. And I remember sitting there for the first time, and it was the first time I was ever in a church where people got vocal. And I remember sitting there, and all of a sudden, somebody behind me said, Amen. And it like just scared me to death. <laughs> and I thought, what are these people up to here? But you know what? God has a way to work. And when I accepted Christ, the next thing that uh, they told me was, we have services on Wednesday night. I said, why? <laughs> that don't make sense, because I play softball on Wednesday night. But you know what? God did a tremendous thing within my life. Got to worship in that small sanctuary. There was even one Sunday when uh, we didn't have a drummer and I played the drums. I have no idea how to play the drums. Yeah. <laughs> Just doing things like that. But you know, also, I remember the first time I stepped into a foot washing service. I didn't know a whole lot about that. I was reading it in Scripture. I was hearing it being taught on, but I didn't know what it was like. And one of the most humbling things that ever happened to me is I sat down for my foot, first foot washing service, and Ed Fry walked over to me and knelt before me and washed my feet. I could hardly contain myself. He wasn't supposed to be doing that to me. I should have been doing that to him. You see, God works in such a mighty, mighty way. And I'm so thankful and excited about being here. If you turn to Matthew chapter 17, say amen if you got it. Amen. If you don't, say that's me. Let's stand. Get your Bibles in the air. Let's say those words. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible word. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I'm never going to be the same today. Matthew 17, starting with verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. When the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, 
Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Heavenly Father, we ask a blessing upon this word. Father God, I ask that you hide me behind a cross, that it's your words being spoken. Lord, to do with what you need to do. Father, we know that your word goes out and it does not return void. There's something specific that happens into the hearts of those who will receive it. Father, there's folks here today that is waiting for a word from you. Lord, there might be many situations that they're facing, but they're waiting for a word from you. And Father, we just ask that your spirit covers us, anoints this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you today on a topic of clearing the hurdle of unbelief. And, and this is very much a topic that's very near and dear to me because of things that have happened in my life, decisions that I have made. And it's important to clear hurdles. Very important. Back when I was in high school, I was a high hurdler. I'm just going to give you time to put that image in your head. Mike put this uh, mic on me and said, just make sure it turns green. I said, once it's on my belt, what makes you think I can see it anymore? <laughs> but I used to run the hurdles. In fact, I mean, it's probably unbelievable. In fact, uh, in, at Defiance High School, I broke the record for the 120-yard high hurdles back in my senior year in 1976. And it's a record that still holds today. Why? Because they went to 110-meter hurdles. That's the way to keep records, right there. So, it stands, nobody cares, but it stands. But you know what? When I was running those, one of the things you had to learn, you had to clear those hurdles, and you got as close to them as you possibly could. You didn't want to hit them too hard, but you could brush across them. If you hit them too hard, it's going to slow you down. The most important thing was that you did clear that hurdle, and every one of them consecutively to get over them. I remember one time I was running 180-yard high hurdles. They didn't have anything like 300 meters, 400-meter hurdles back then. It was 180-yard low hurdles. And we took off and started the race. And I got to the second set of hurdles. My steps were off, and I hit it hard. I mean, I hit it hard. I went tumbling to the track, and I just sat there. And I watched the race finish. And I stayed there. And people over in the stands were watching, wondering why I wasn't getting up. And I just sat there. Finally, a couple of my friends ran over to me and said, you okay? I said, yeah. Why aren't you getting up? He said, the backside of my shorts are all ripped out. <laughs> I can't get up. You see, I, I needed to clear the hurdle, and sometimes it's devastating when those types of things don't happen. I'll tell you, there's a hurdle of unbelief within our lives that needs to be, not must be cleared on a continuous basis because we are in this battle. Life is tough at best. Every day we have tough, tough times within our lives. Every day we face hurdles. Every day we face things within our lives that's hard, and we need to clear those hurdles. It's very important. You know, I love this passage of Scripture, and I, I just kind of want to qualify a few things of what's being talked about here. When Jesus said to his disciples after it happened, and they questioned, why couldn't we do this? Why couldn't we heal? He said this very plainly. He says, because it's your unbelief. Your unbelief did that. And you see, we have something within our life that's called faith. We try to, try to work out this faith. We try to live in this faith. We try to live by faith. We try to walk by faith and not by sight. But what hinders that faith is unbelief. You see, a lot of times we, we look at it in the wrong way. We'll be battling something within our lives and we'll say, well, we have some little faith. Now, it's not that you have little faith. There's unbelief. There's doubt that has crept in. You see, there's a difference. Because God tells us in Romans 12, 3, that he dealt out the measure of faith to each one of us. And I praise God for that because when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and when you did that, he dealt out a measure of faith to us. And that measure of faith was planted within us. And basically, in essence, God was saying, listen, you have faith. I'm giving you this faith. 
It's a faith you need to work on. It's a faith you need to strengthen. It's a faith that you need to learn about every day of your life. It's a faith that's going to come from reading the Word of God. That's going to make it stronger. But you have this faith. And one of the biggest things that weakens our faith is doubt, unbelief. And all of a sudden, this doubt, this unbelief starts to creep into our lives. And we start to battle with it. You see, we think that it's just the battle against the enemy. And we'll talk that way. I'm battling the devil today. No, not really. I'm not saying the devil doesn't have a part of this. But listen, understand this. Jesus Christ defeated the devil. He's a defeated foe. He defeated him for us. And when he defeated him for us, he provided a way of salvation. He planted within us faith. And he says, listen, you can walk around victorious within your life. But you have to work on this thing called unbelief. Well, aren't I battling the devil? Well, in essence, you are doing some battle with the devil. But one of the things that happens, and and I've learned this too well within my life, is that as soon as we start having doubt and we start mauling over things within our minds the battle begins between these ears and now i have a battle with my mind the way i'm thinking the way i'm processing things and as soon as i start with that battle and as soon as that doubt is there it opens up the door and it allows the enemy to come in It allows the enemy to do with that that we are already thinking about. You see, and he doesn't come in and and try to just destroy us. He comes in as a friend. Hey, your thoughts that you're thinking right now? Yeah, those are good thoughts. That's probably it. You think you can't do this? You're probably right. You can't do this. But then again, who expects you to do that? Well, the church people? You can't do that. Well, I can't have victory in this part of my life. The devil's saying, yeah, you can't have victory in this part of your life. But it's okay. You don't need to have victory within this part of your life. And we start battling in our minds. We open up a door. Satan walks in. And we allow him to live here rent-free. This is where he's at. And you start the battle. Jesus said to them, listen... It's because of your unbelief. And then I love how he shares with them afterwards by saying this. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed. In other words, if you have faith that's living and active like a seed, you'll be able to say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. You know what we do? We look at that type of scripture and we say to ourselves, man, I've got little faith. It's not even as big as a mustard seed. And that's not what God's saying. God's saying, no, I've dealt you the measure of faith, but your unbelief has weakened your faith. It's weakened it. And now your faith isn't as strong as it needs to be. It's weak. And because it's weak, you're allowing that doubt, that unbelief, you're allowing those thoughts that you're not taken captive into Christ Jesus. You're allowing those thoughts to play and wreak havoc within your mind about a certain situation. Let let me give you a a little practical illustration of that. For the first time this year, I got to go down with a group of guys from from Free Christian and some other ones down to Myrtle Beach to golf. I was so excited because I haven't been able to do this. And it was a good time to go down. The last day that we were there... Jim and I were golfing together with uh, Steve and Jerry, and uh, I was trying some things, but by no means am I a good golfer, so whenever I try things, it's just like funny. But I was trying some things where if I got behind something, I would hold my hands a different way, and I was actually starting to bend the ball around obstacles. Well, I need to do that because I have obstacles all the time in my golf game. So I'm trying to bend the... So we're on this one hole, and out in front of the green of this one hole is a huge body of water, and it spans all the way across. So on my second shot, I hit it to the right, and we go pulling up there, and I had all the belief in the world in what I could do. 
I got out of that cart, I grabbed my club, and I looked, and in front of me was some water, some stones and rocks, some trees. On this side was some houses, and I got out of that cart, and I'm thinking, man, I'm just going to bend it right around the left, right up there's the green. I'm going to get it close enough where I can just chip right on that green. And I stood up to that ball, and I started looking. I said, well, what if I hit them rocks? Oh, no, I could probably miss, well, them trees. I'll probably hit them trees. I'll probably get in the water. If I go this way, I'm going to hit those houses. And there was a guy sitting, standing out in the porch drinking his coffee, watching. I'm thinking, what if I hit him? <laughs> it, this, this might not be a very good idea. And pretty soon I turned to go, okay, I'm just going to hit it out in the fairway and play it safe. And my pastor says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to play it safe. You know, Steve and Jerry's out there. They look pretty comfortable. I'm going out there with them. He said, just bend it around. I said, I'm going to kill this guy over here. Now, from being so confident in my shot, now I'm killing this guy. I had it in my mind. And after mulling that on in my mind, I stood up and I thought, okay, Jim said to hit it, I'm going to hit it. I had visions of us, me hitting this guy, Jumping in the cart, us heading down the fairway, throwing out First Baptist Church Myrtle Beach logo golf balls and throw them off the trail. <laughs> and I decide I'm going to just go ahead and hit it, but I lost all my confidence. I hit the ball, I hit the bank into the rocks, and stopped. I was happy. I was delighted, delighted with the outcome. I mean, I didn't kill this guy. Everything was cool. Even though my, my next state was worse than my former state, I was happy. And the guy was setting up for a drink and probably going, idiot. <laughs> but listen, this is what we do in our lives. Now hear me. You know, that's, that's part of life. We try things. But here's what we do. We get in situations in our life. Situations with our jobs, situations with our families, situations with our children, situations in our marriage, situations with our finance, situations that might be an addiction. We might have problems being addicted to alcohol and drugs. We might have a problem being addicted to pornography. We get into situations within our lives and we do the very same thing. We come to church on Sunday morning and we get excited. We come to church on Sunday morning and we hear a message. If you come out early enough, you go to a Sunday school where a teacher has put their heart into studying and ready to prepare a lesson and you get to hear a lesson from the Word of God. You get to take in everything that God's Word is telling you and then you step into Monday. We step into reality. And we take it with boldness. We take it with confidence to say, you know what? I'm trusting God because let me tell you something. How can I set in a situation like this with the praise songs going on, with the Word of God being preached, and not trust God? But we find ourselves in a situation. The situation is brought forward even more in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 about this very same story. When the man who had the son who needed to be healed said this to Jesus. Jesus told him, anything's possible if you believe. And he said these confusing words. He said, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. You see, what we do is we hold on to our belief. Every one of you would say that I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that He shed His blood for me. I believe that He rose again from the... I believe in salvation through that blood. I believe in the forgiveness of sins through that blood. I believe that there's power with the Holy Spirit. I believe that God sent His Holy Spirit to live within me. But help my unbelief. When I'm facing the situations that I face and I start to doubt, I start to doubt whether God's going to pull me out. I start to doubt whether that he even cares anymore. Listen, I'm talking from experience within my life. When things started to happen and in my mind that warfare was going on, and I started to doubt. 
Did I doubt in my salvation? I really didn't. Did I doubt who Jesus was? Absolutely not. Did I doubt in the blood of Jesus? Did I doubt in His Word? No, I wasn't even doubting His Word. I was doubting the fact of whether that Word can truly be applied to my life. You see, we get caught up in our situations where it looks so hard, it looks so tough, it looks like it's, everything's pressing in on all sides. And even though Scripture says that they will press in, but you'll never be destroyed, we start to doubt. We start to doubt whether we can be freed from something. Whether God really will reach down. One of my favorite hymn songs of the Church of God is when He reached down and lifted me out of the deep miry clay. When He settled my feet on that straight narrow way. When He lifted me up to a heavenly place and floodeth my soul each day with His grace. But you start to doubt. Unbelief creeps in and your faith starts to weaken. My faith was getting weak when it needed to be strong. Things happen within your lives when your faith starts to get weak. Not only does doubt enter in, but you start looking at yourself differently. You start looking at yourself like you just can't do it. And even questioning, was I even meant to do it? When you start battling with things such as guilt and depression... And I want to tell you something. That's one of the ways that our faith is weakened is when we're able to put ourselves into the midst of guilt and depression. Because here's what it does. It absolutely paralyzes you. It paralyzes you. Your life is of no effect. It debilitates you. You can't do the things that you want to do. You start understanding a little bit better about Paul in Romans 7. He says, the things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I'm doing. And it's because we start to battle and we start to struggle and, and our faith is getting weak because we're doubting the power of God. What's the power? The God says that through faith, storms are calmed. He says sins are forgiven. He says you're made well. You can be, you can be healed. He says by this strong faith, you're saved. By this strong faith, you can stand fast. By this strong faith, you have access to the throne of God. And every time we doubt and every time we let unbelief come in, we weaken that faith. And when we weaken that faith, we start thinking of things. Folks, you know what I'm talking about. You start mulling over things. You start thinking of things that, that hurt you. They're not lining up with the Word of God anymore. God says, I can be free. Every Sunday, you hold up this Bible and you say, I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Well, he tells us that we're a child of a king. But when unbelief creeps in, our faith weakens. We don't believe that so much anymore because we don't act like a child of the king. He says that I have victory. He says that He's come to give us life and life more abundant. He says this is something that we have and this is something that we can possess. He tells me I'm more than a conqueror. He tells me I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. But do I believe it? Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. We get to a point in our lives where we get tired of where we're at. And when we're tired of where we're at, we only have a few things we can do. We can come to Christ Jesus on our knees saying, Lord, help my unbelief. My faith is weak. I need you powerfully within my life. I want to take a hold of your promises and I want to believe these promises. I want to truly stand on them, not just sing about them. I want to stand on them. I want to hold on to them within my life. Or we can give up and we can walk away convincing ourselves that we can have another life apart from this. And I want to tell you something, you can't. You can't. Because God is able to free you. God is able to release you. I found myself in my life starting to go into Scripture. 
The Bible tells me that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. I started praying Scripture. I love to pray Scripture. If you never prayed Scripture, it's powerful. I started praying Scripture. And as I started praying Scripture, what I was doing is I was holding on to the promise that God was giving me. When my mind started to drift, I wouldn't let it. I would capture it. And you can capture your mind wherever you're at. Whether I was at work, whether I was at play, whatever was taking place, if my mind started to drift, I would capture it with the Word of God. Sometimes it was through just the Word that I was reciting over and over again within me. Sometimes it was through songs that I would sing. I love praise songs. I love what praises does. You know, the Word of God says that God inhabits the praises of men, and I believe that. So when I'm praising Him, I know His presence with me. I know that I can just praise Him and praise Him. I can just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When I start saying, thank you, Jesus, those thoughts can't dwell there. They can't last there. They can't survive there. The only thing that can is the power of God Almighty. I find out that through Scripture, the enemy is defeated. I find out that through love, the enemy is defeated. Scripture also tells us in Romans that receive one who is weak in the faith. Receive them. Not to disputes. Sometimes as Christians we can be our worst enemies. Somebody be feeling a certain way, and I'll tell you, feelings are feelings. They're not right, they're not wrong, they're just feelings. And somebody will state something on how they're feeling and we'll say to them, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. Don't do that. Realize how many people I had tell me just saying, quit doing that. Oh, that, uh, that's it? I didn't know it was that easy. I'm trying to quit doing it. I'm battling. It's a fight. It's spiritual warfare. But when we get into the Word of God and we start saying the Word of God and repeating the Word of God within our lives, there's power. Every night I pray... And I pray Psalm 91 over my family, my children. I believe it. I believe it. You know what I was taught when I was worshiping here at Free Christian? I was taught that I don't have to trust in Free Christian Church of God. I don't have to trust in Pastor Jim Fry. I have to trust the God that has anointed this place. That's my trust. It's the God who laid His hands upon this pastor one day. It's the God who anointed this place here. It's that God that I have to trust that He can anoint us and He can deliver us. No matter what your situation is today, no matter what you're battling with, no matter what's taking place right here, this is the start of it. Capture it. Come to God and say, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe that you can lift me out of this situation. I believe that you can bring victory to it. I believe it, but help my unbelief. Take care of me. And let Him take care of you. One of the things that I got to find out is that it doesn't matter what the situation is at all. God is able. And He loves us more than we could ever imagine. He's put a love in us that's tremendous. He's given us power through His Spirit that's like no other. And it doesn't matter what you're in today. You can come to this throne of grace. And you can have access to Him by faith. And you can let him know that you're doubting something. Sometimes we're scared to do that. We get caught up in all this, I can't doubt anything. You can let him know that, Lord, I'm not sure how this is going to look. I'm not sure what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, a month from now. But help my unbelief. All I want to do is trust you. I want to lay everything at your feet. Lay everything there. 
and let you take care of it. Back in the Old Testament, any time someone came to an altar, it was to kill something. Something had to die. We live in this new era of grace. When we come to the altar, you know what dies? Self. Lord, I've tried everything I could do. I've tried every way to get out of this. I'm giving it over to you. I trust you. I'm dying to self. I'm letting you do it. If you have something today to turn over to God, turn it over. Don't wait. Don't walk out with it. Don't think you already have the solution yourself. Don't let doubt enter into your mind that weakens your faith. Capture it now. Come to him and give it over to him. That's what this altar's all about. And the one thing I learn from being here is there's freedom. Freedom to come. Freedom to bear it. Freedom to lay it there and then to walk away from it. That's what God's all about. If you have weak faith, start to strengthen it right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Stand with me as we pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you right now, Lord. We just thank you and we praise you. Father, those who are here this morning, Lord, that may be holding on to something, may be struggling with something, Lord, that they're not sure if they're ever going to get out of it. If now they're just saying, well, Lord, maybe this is the way you want me. This is what you have for me. It's just my lot in life. Lord, I pray that today is a day for them to give everything over into your hands. I pray that they come and with boldness say, Lord, you know my heart. I believe, but help my unbelief in this situation. I give it into your hands. I surrender all. All of it's to you. Just touch my life now. I'm tired of it. I don't want to carry it anymore. I want to give it into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.